it was they did, and I actually started refunding the money on my own. This is something I felt very passionately about, that if somebody was going to choose option A, you shouldn't have a group of people who had one set of contributions at one rate and a group of people who would actually follow the rules and the intent. I think it's the right thing to do, and frankly, I don't think we should have to legislate it. I can't believe we're standing here having an argument over how much big money people should get to take after the voters said, we want politicians to take less big money. I don't compare myself to other elected officials. What I will say is I, I represent the Upper East Side. The Upper East Side has a lot of real estate development there. And I can tell you, and I already made these remarks, there is so much real estate money that has been offered to me that I have been refusing that it isn't even funny and it scares me and it is scaring me into trying to get this legislation forward. And, and I promise you that that, that money is there, and when elected officials actually do the right thing and are saying no to big money, that is something that we should be encouraging and welcoming and not saying no. I, I don't think that there are people out there saying that they want elected officials taking more big money from special interests to do their bidding. I don't think that's the case. Uh, they just they, I, I, but they just voted in favor of this, which is what that accomplished. But like, there are a lot of people who just don't agree with that. I'm sure there are, but the voters just voted on this in November and o voted for it overwhelmingly. And you guys are changing what the voters did. I know if I Hold on, you're changing your argument mid-question. I'm not making an argument. I'm asking questions. I don't care either way. So, so I, I, I will say that whenever I've asked, whenever. Yeah, it's okay. Sorry. Um, we're trying to take big money out of politics. And we have the best campaign finance system in the United States of America. And this deepens the commitment uh, to that. Um, uh, again, the campaign finance board requested this. Good government groups have said this is the right decision. Uh, and uh, Adonis Rodriguez, who ran for public advocate, had to return money. And he did it to get the eight to one match. And Melissa maintained the six to one. And Melissa Marvivarito stayed in the six to one system. A decision was made, they did it. Uh, there wasn't a dust up over it at the time because it was us trying to create a level of consistency in the system. Again, no one is being forced to uh, opt into the eight to one system. We are just saying that if you're gonna opt into one system, be consistent throughout the entire cycle. That is what we're saying here. You pick, the campaign finance board supported it, good government groups support it. This bill's been around a long time. The retroactivity is something that Ben pushed for as, uh, as the prime sponsor, that the chair of the committee, Fernando Cabrera, pushed for, and that Councilmember Lander, who was one of the original co-sponsors in the previous bill, pushed for. The three of them pushed for these changes, and I thought it made sense, given it would create a level of consistency across the board from uh, what we did in the public advocates race and to have consistency throughout the entire cycle. Joe? Mm -hmm. um, how do you square this provision, like the full public match? Mm -hmm. It is different than what the voters have voted mm -hmm. on, but it's also supported by all the good government groups, but also would help your campaign if you have maybe pledged to raise only small donations of less than 250. How do you square the fact that it will help you in your race with the fact that you know, it's also supported by good government groups? And everybody else? I mean, I, I don't want to get too political, sort of campaigny here at this, uh, you know. Um, press conference, but I'll tell you that it's really hard to raise money in small chunks. If you're not someone who has a massive following and a gigantic um, email list, it's a lot of work. So I, I feel like I've put my actually self at a disadvantage by, by self-imposing a $250 limit. Now, the only reason I can do that is because we have such a great campaign finance system. Otherwise, I never could have contemplated doing something like that. But I can tell you that in the last few months that I have been uh, fundraising, it is very hard to raise money only at $250. Um, so, and no one, else has, no, no one else has done this, and they haven't done it for a reason. They haven't done it because it's really, really hard to do. I mean, I don't think I realized how difficult it was when I made this decision in January. Um, 
And so it's a real challenge. Again, the bill has been around for multiple years. So the bill existed before I was speaker. The bill existed before I explored a citywide office. The bill's been around for years now when I was an original co-sponsor of the bill. So it's not like I sort of came onto the bill at the last moment when it looked like that it was gonna benefit me. I have consistently uh, been on the bill for years now. And on the increasing the public match, the original system before the voters weighed in was 55% public match. The commission chose 75% public match. They could have chose higher. It was sort of a, you know, it was a number that they kind of batted around a little bit. And because, again, at the time of the mayor calling the Charter Revision Commission, I had said, uh, I think the day after his State of the City address in early 2018, that I thought that the most appropriate place for campaign finance measures to be uh, enacted was at the city council, given it's part of our legislative purview and it's what we've always done. I had said, we still have the right to weigh in on this. Um, so I don't think there's any level of sort of inconsistency in what we've done. And you know, it's hard to vote on these things because anytime you vote on these things, you're potentially affecting yourself and your colleagues and what you do. The same thing could be said in Albany and, and the commission that they're putting forward on a, on a campaign finance system. It's one of the challenging things you deal with as a current elected official when you start to look at the, the system that exists and how you seek to improve it or change it. Do you have a follow up? I feel like you did. Um, I was just going to say, I think the timing is sort of the fact that Bill has been around for a long time, and then you made this pledge, and then now it's being put to the council. I think that's part of the criticism of the, if you pledge to take donations that are two fifty or less, this essentially cuts the number of, you know, the minimum number of donors, and you need almost a cap. So I think it's, I think the timing is part of the, sort of what people are looking at. I mean, I think that would be fair if. The bill was just recently drafted and rushed through and hadn't been around or debated, but it's been around for years. It's not like this is a, a brand new bill that right when I decided that I was gonna do this, I said, Ben, will you draft this bill? And the bill's been around, I co-sponsored it. I was publicly on the bill. So, I mean, it showed that I had supported this. As Ben said, during the speaker's race, we were asked about this at one of the forums. I said that I wanted to pass it in the speaker's race, publicly, on the record, to a good government group. So I think the facts of that I was on it, that I made a public pledge during the speaker's race, it shows where I had been all along. I don't see any level of inconsistency there. Uh, Rich? I'm gonna take a slightly different angle on this. Okay. I, th I think you can do multiple things at once, and we're in the middle of a budget process right now um, that hopefully will uh, achieve a lot of the things you just outlined in getting more money for parks and for libraries and for uh, sanitation pickup, things that communities really, really care about, uh, criminal justice reform. So uh, we're focused on that. I mean, the, the finan our finance division, and it's not a final number, it's a cost estimate. I think we estimated it at $3.8 million is what the potential cost will be. It could run higher. It the entire uh, I mean, it depends. Part of it's hard to, it's hard to get an exact number. It's a ballpark because we don't know the exact number of candidates yet. Well, here's so, I think we want to get big money out of elections. And I think, you know, we want to, I, I support fully financing uh, public elections, but there are a variety of ways you can accomplish that. I mean, there's a conversation that's being had about democracy vouchers in Seattle. Uh, there are other places around the country that are trying innovative things. I think there's a lot of cynicism in government 
because people feel like big donors have too much access in government. And here's a way to actually take big money out and have it be publicly financed. You have to pick you have to pick a, you have to sort of pick what you want. And the city, I think, has been hailed for years as a model campaign finance law, though. I mean, we have issues with the campaign finance system uh, that we talk about. But I think by and large, this is a great system and this is us deepening our commitment to it. You saw the voters overwhelmingly vote in favor and they were voting in favor of increasing the public dollars that were going to be dedicated uh, to uh, elections. That's that's what you saw with the voters. So. I think it's consistent with that. I'm not concerned about it. Can I jump in briefly? Uh, whenever I've asked anyone in New York City to, to donate to my campaign, I, rare, I, I don't think I've ever had anyone say to me, oh, I don't want my dollars matched. Uh, in fact, I think overwhelmingly what I hear from people is, this is really great that I can give you twenty ten dollars and it becomes $90. It really incentivizes me to give. Campaign Finance Board puts out an annual report after post-election report, and every time they do it, they find that it, the public match is increasing participation and that the taxpayers, the residents, actually like it. They like having their voices amplified and they like having direct access to elected officials that otherwise wouldn't. In terms of the costs, uh, it was, it, Based on the estimates, it was 38.2 in 2013, which was the last competitive election. Uh, it was estimated that it would be 52.1 at the 75% match with the people voted for. And if it went up to 61.5, that's $9 million. Now your paper, the New York Post, reported on a land deal uh, where there was a campaign contributions involved and that that land deal resulted in something being given to a developer uh, where I think they got $100 million above market and that there were questions around it. And one of the reasons I believe in campaign finance reform is I don't think a mayor or any other elected official should be in a position where they got their handout for $5,100 or more and then doing things that might be questionable and then you see all that money. And so when you compare losses of $100 million that your paper uncovered, uh, I believe the Daily News uh, uncovered other si similar situations where uh, there was a campaign contribution. Uh, it, the, the Daily News, so you covered in terms of one housing piece, the Daily News covered something around NYCHA infill and a donor who gave $30,000. And this changes all of that. And when you talk about folks, what have you, so I think it's just, it will cost save people money in terms of any bad deals we might be seeing. Rich. Change the subject. Sure. <laughs> well, we keep talking about it. I just wanted to ask Council, Councilwoman Barron about that commi the commitment to what is a task force. Mm -hmm. uh, the statues task force. And you have a short list of statues you're interested in especially. And who would be on the task force? How okay. Okay, the members of the task force would include the chair, who would be the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs or the Executive Director of the Art Commission. And the other members would be the Commissioner of City Planning, the Parks and Recreation Commissioner, Transportation Commissioner, Landmarks, Com Landmarks and Preservation Commissioner, and there would be five borough representatives on that task force as well. And the five borough uh, members would be selected based on their expertise in history, in preservation, in education, in arts and antiquity, in public uh, public actions and public sp public art and public space, cultural heritage, and diversity and inclusion. So those would be the members, and those would be the criteria under which they would be selected. Whomever you can think of that people have questioned would be on the list. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Inez. Thank you. Yes, Gloria. That, yes. Are you assuring that there might be a, a budget deal in the works? Do you have an update for us about where those costs are? I know we're not ready to finish, but just give us like a general, where are we today with budget? I'm a little tired today because we've been working uh, late into the night, and I really want to thank the staff here that has worked really, really hard around the clock. They've been here all weekend and 
last night they were here, I think Thomas till midnight, uh, working on this, negotiating with the mayor's side. So um, we are, uh, I think in the, in the red zone, we're inside the 20 yard line. We are doing our best to try to get there, um, but we're not done yet. And we need to not act in a rushed way, but uh, sort of get a really good budget. So I don't know if we're gonna have a handshake tonight. There's still unresolved issues. Um, and I think the budget negotiations have been in good faith. We're pushing really hard on the things you saw in our budget response, more funding for libraries, more funding for parks, more funding for sanitation, a deeper commitment to criminal justice reform, figuring out the pay parity issue uh, for the pre-K workers who are not part of the DOE but a part of community-based organizations. We're looking at uh, the legal defense community and having pay parity there. And then uh, we're trying to do some more for uh, kids in the foster system. So there's a variety of things that we're pushing for. We're pushing really hard on it. We're also focused on reserves, uh, increasing our reserves by $250 million to show responsibility and prudence when that downturn eventually comes. So those are the conversations that we're having. I think we've made some really good progress. I'm grateful to the mayor's team in um, operating in good faith. And, uh, but we're not done yet. We, we're still negotiating. And um, I mean, a lot's gonna depend on what happens for the rest of today in those budget negotiations. Um, so there's no deal to have a handshake tonight. Do you, it sounds like the, the negotiations are, are they slowly, I mean, can you characterize them a bit more? Has it been, I mean, is there anything, any one thing that you are still negotiating over in terms of? There's a bunch. There's a bunch of things we're still negotiating over. I don't wanna, I don't want to say specifically what they are, but there's a lot of areas that we still don't have resolution on, but I think there's been really productive, honest conversations about some of the challenges involved, but also why we're prioritizing certain things as a city council. Um, but I, I feel good about where we are. You know, I, I didn't feel good about way, the way this budget process started <clears throat> when the executive budget was released. There was $155 million in things that we got funded last year, which 95% uh, of it didn't show up in the mayor's executive budget, uh, which I didn't think was a good way to start off the budget process. There were some cuts and pegs involved to libraries and to culturals and to some key DOE programs that we don't support. So um, that was not a good way to start off the budget. And I think you heard real anger and consternation from not just myself at that first executive budget hearing with the Office of Management and Budget, but you heard it from every council member as well, how disappointed and how unacceptable people thought it was. So we, I think, have made significant progress since that point, a lot of progress, but we are not done yet. And that's why it's funny when I see people saying, there's gonna be a handshake tonight. Like, no one told me there's a handshake tonight. I didn't say I'm shaking anyone's hand tonight. Um, uh, I think you might be okay. I mean, who knows? We'll see how negotiations go. I, I, I mean, maybe we can do that together. I need to do the same thing. <laughs> I'm on Hinge. Um, Pete Buttigieg signed up for Hinge. I signed up for Hinge. Uh, no. Um, Chase. No, so he's great. I think he's great. Fantastic. He's really good. He's great. Chase. I think we have to look at cutting down uh, non-essential flights. And the, one of the complicating factors, not in this instance, this instance, the helicopter did take off from a New York City heliport, but in a lot of the flights that we get complaints about, they're helicopters that take off from New Jersey. And we don't have any regulatory say over that. It's really the, the Federal Aviation Administration that has to do a better job regulating those type of flights. For New York City, I'm concerned that uh, starting in the next potential couple of months, you're gonna see the Uber helicopter flights between Lower Manhattan and JFK for the ultra, ultra, ultra 
you know, 1% because it's $200 one way to go from lower Manhattan to JFK to get your flight uh, over there. And, and I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned not just for safety reasons, but that's a major concern, but also quality of life concerns. You know, residents don't like hearing helicopters that are flying at a low level above their neighborhood. Uh, and, and unless they're totally necessary, I think we need to look at cutting them down. The de Blasio administration, the Economic Development Corporation, a few years ago, before I was speaker, came to an agreement with the tourist helicopter flight companies on doing, I believe, a 50% reduction uh, on those flights, and they came to some agreement there. I think there needs to be a conversation about not just tourist flights, but other type of flights as well. Do we need that many? What are the safety precautions? How do we protect the quality of life? What are our conversations with our counterparts in New Jersey? And what is our interaction with the New York congressional delegation and the Federal Aviation Administration on having that conversation? It becomes much more complicated because we are on the border of another state that has multiple heliports as well. So those are things we need to look at. And it's not the easiest area for the council to legislate in because of those different dynamics that I just uh, described. So what can you do other than ask? We're, we can look at potential uh, legislation, but I don't have anything to announce today. Uh, but I do think it's an area to look at. I can tell you that in the last six weeks, my office has been receiving on a almost daily basis complaints of helicopters from five o'clock in the morning when the sun is coming up or six o'clock in the morning when the sun is, is rising all the way until dusk when the sun is setting that multiple helicopters are coming into Chelsea and literally sitting above West 23rd Street. Um, and it's creating a major quality of life issue. It's also a safety concern as well. And it's weird that just we're getting an influx of these complaints in the lab, you're getting them as well? Yeah, a ton for Stytown. Yeah. yeah. So something's happening. And so it's an area we have to look at. But I, I, I don't have enough information to tell you today what that potential legislation could look like because of the existing dynamics that I described. And just to follow up, do you support uh, Congresswoman Maloney's uh, push to ban all flights over Manhattan over to New Jersey? I need to look at it more, but I would say, uh, without having all the information, the likely answer is yes. I mean, I think it's a safety concern, a quality of life concern, and that is how I would lean. But again, I would need to look at what exactly she said, but if that's the gist of it, yes. Uh, let me go to uh, Rich and then Joe. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> uh, it's still been a challenging negotiation. I mean, it's still, it's not been like, they haven't come to the table and said, oh, everything you've asked for, you're getting. That's not how it's worked. There's been like a real back and forth of us, you know, very respectfully fighting on issues that are important to us. So. You know, I met with the mayor last week for an extended period of time, I think it was last Wednesday, um, to talk about the budget stuff. And we made a, a commitment to have our staffs work around the clock to try to get resolution. They've been doing that. I think we've made some good progress. You know, I was on the phone at uh, midnight last night getting budget updates. So we're still working hard. No, I mean, I. I feel like it's my job as speaker to look out for the interests of council members in their communities. And I've tried to, if you talk to, I think, every member, I've tried to be incredibly responsive to when Councilor Barron or Powers or Kalos or Rodriguez come to me and say, this is a really important thing for me to you to fight for. I do that. And so they haven't just given in, you know, because the mayor's running for president. I mean, I think that, um, they know how unhappy I was with what was in their executive budget or what was not in their executive budget. We made that very, very clear. So we're gonna continue to have a real, thorough, respectful negotiation moving forward. Joe? Uh, 
I don't want to preempt the handshake. I mean, there are going to be, I think, some very exciting things to announce. And I think you're going to see some very big things, things that were in our budget response, things the council has prioritized year after year, but we don't have final numbers because we have to, you know, it's like interlocking puzzle pieces and how it all fits together on the dollar amounts. So we are continuing I am continuing to push as hard as I can for libraries. I think they're really important. They're egalitarian. They serve immigrants and uh, people of all incomes in every community. So I'm pushing really hard on library funding. I'm pushing really hard on park funding. Parks are egalitarian as well. And we're going into a major part of the park season uh, for New York City in the summer. We're pushing really hard on additional sanitation pickup. We're pushing really hard on pay parity for a variety of sectors of the workforce in New York City. And most of the people that are affected are women of color that have been getting paid far too less for far too long. And it's been a systemic injustice that's been allowed to exist. We're pushing really hard on deeper criminal justice reform given the criminal justice reforms we are going to see go into effect on January 1st. So those are some of the areas that we have really, really been focused on. And then we're fighting back some of the pegs, some of the program to eliminate the gap cuts that we didn't think were um, wise, whether they related to cultural institutions or uh, libraries or schools. We're fighting those as well. So those are some of the, to give you a flavor of kind of what some of the talks have gone around, but I don't, I don't have an announcement today on we've won this, we've won that. I, again, things are, I think, heading in a good direction, but it's not final yet. I think that the, um, let me just say, Joe, I have so many numbers in my head in all these negotiations, so if I get this wrong, let the finance division correct the number. But I think that we saw a really significant additional increase in personal income tax money that has come in since the executive budget. So the revised revenue estimates from the Office of Management and Budget and their revenue division, we saw, I believe, an additional, I think, $450 million. Though, again, don't hold me to that number. Let me check for you that has come in since the executive budget revenue estimate came out. And then I think there was a decrease in un unincorporated tax uh, business revenue. I think there was a decrease or a projected potential decrease in property tax revenue, not for this year, but for the out years and how that sort of affects how we budget. Um, so, but what you did see overall, even with some shortfalls in some of the other uh, tax collection areas is you saw a really significant influx of personal income tax money that, come, that came in that wasn't expected. And so that has affected the budget negotiations in the amount of money we have to actually budget for the revenue that's come in, which is why I'm continuing to push really hard on that $250 million in budget reserves. Gloria? I think the big, the big one, I think the big one, though there are, I'll give you, I'll give you kind of like three. I think the really big one is we need pay parity for these child care workers and providers. We need, need, need it. It is a huge amount of money, uh, but it is worth it. It is the right thing to do. It has been an injustice for far too long and we need to get it done. So we put this, we asked for this last year and it didn't get done. We thought maybe it could get done through labor negotiations. So we need to get that done. And we are talking about that and how to get it done every single day. And we've been doing that for a month now, talking about it every single day, internal conversations. It, it's really important. Number two is, again, um, it's not the sexiest item, but I think budget reserves are really important for the future budgeting of New York City and being responsible and prudent in our planning for when that downturn and slowdown comes. We saw that stock market volatility in December and January and how it threw off the potential above it, the, the budget estimates. So that's number two. And number three are some of the 
uh, really important qu quality of life things and investments you have, need to make for neighborhoods that we all represent. School funding, parks funding, library funding, sanitation funding. I think you're gonna hopefully see a grab bag of increases on some of those items that are really important um, to our communities. And then the conversation around criminal justice reform. Uh, was yesterday, yesterday, no, no, it was in person, yesterday morning around noon. No, it was here, it was here. It was uh, about an hour and a half and it was, um, it was a productive meeting. Any other questions, Rich? I can't change it. I made a commitment, and I think it's a lot harder than I realized. If you had a foreign power call you, I mean, Jimmy Otto is definitely a foreign power. <laughs> um, I would say uh, I would not change. So I'm uh, I'm stuck at I'm stuck at the 250, and if that means I raise less money. I'm gonna raise less money. I don't think money is, money is what wins elections. I think you need to have an inspiring, captivating message that New Yorkers connect to. And I also think you need to be relatable and authentic in how you conduct yourself as an elected official. I think those are the two things. I think there are plenty of people here that have won elections with less money than their opponent. Um, it's through how you talk about the issues, how you motivate people, how you inspire people, um, and how you relate to people. Money is, of course, something that is part of elections, but I don't think it's the thing that wins elections. And I think um, you see that uh, to this day. You see you know, certain billionaires or millionaires who get into Senate races or gubernatorial races and spend 50, 60, 70, 80 million dollars and don't win because they don't have the right message. So I'm stuck at 250. That's what I'm going to do. If it means I raise, if it means I raise less money, then I'll raise less money and I'll operate with the money that I have. I think it was still the right decision to make because I think there's a lot of cynicism um, about potential pay-to-play and appearances uh, and perception. And for me, um, you know, it was the right decision to make, even if and even if it ends up affecting me. So you're hearing it here today. I. At no point over the next two and a half years am I going to change my mind and raise more than $250. I made that announcement. I am stuck at that number. It has made it, I'm not, not like saying woe is me, but to follow up on Joe's earlier question, it has made it significantly harder to raise money. Like substantially harder to raise money. And just remember, the public funds payout does not happen from a long time from now, which means that like I have far less money throughout the entire cycle to work with. I don't get that infusion of upfront money. You know, I, I'm, I'm literally operating with far less money than everyone else from now until when that first payment happens, which makes it even more challenging in hiring staff, in buying equipment, and doing things that campaigns get to do. But it's a decision I make and I have to live with it. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Nice, Yep. Yeah.